Of all the birds that Scotland has to offer, this one is probably my favourite, the Capercaillie. The charismatic bird of ancient forests is safe to say is a bit of a local legend in the country, with stories, poems, dances, and even a music band drawing inspiration from it. Thousands of tourists go to their hotspots every year, and when I went myself many years ago, I was lucky to see a male at RSPB's Loch Garden. But looking back a decade later, I feel even more privileged to have seen this bird now, because I'll be surprised to see another in Scotland. The Capricaly has declined, and from a healthy population of about 20,000 birds a century ago, there now may be as few as 700 left. They have now disappeared from the vicinity of Loch Garten, and it is feared that they will be gone across Scotland within the next two or three decades. As a lifelong outdoor enthusiast and conservationist, I'd hate to lose such a bird during my lifetime, but I do have hope. Because the Capicalia is with us all year round, it's only up to us in Britain to decide the bird's future here, and until the bird is gone, we should remain optimistic. So in this video, I'll be exploring the Capicalia's tail in Britain, touching on the bird's ecology, history, threats and conservation, to show how we've come to this situation and how we can get out of it. But this video isn't just about saving one bird, because some of the solutions that can rescue it are also linked to improving the UK's social, economic and environmental future. So hopefully I can convince you why it's in all our interest to save this awesome bird. So let's first explore the life of the Capicaillie, where we can find them and what they need to thrive. So the Capicaillie, or Kappa as they're sometimes called, is the largest member of the grouse family, a group of birds that are typically heavyset, ground nesting and polygamous. Thankfully, its global range is quite large, being found right across the coniferous belt from Scotland to Siberia, although its European range has fragmented recently. It's quite a distinctive species, with its only close relative, the black-billed Capicale, living only in the remote larch forests of Far Eastern Russia. Generally, the bird prefers relatively open, ancient coniferous woodland, with some understory for protection cover when on the ground. For much of the year, they eat pine needles, but it's also important that they have access to small bogs and semi-open patches rich in plants and berries, for they'll feed on these in spring and summer. Bilberries are a particular favourite, and they'll eat the stems and leaves as well as the fruit. Like most grouse, the sexes are very different, with the mostly dark males being much larger than the cryptic females. But as well as its impressive appearance, the males are also infamous for their mating displays. In spring, they form what is known as a lek, which comes from the Norse word for play, to decide who gets to control the best breeding areas. The males fan their tails, emit a series of pops, wheezes and gurgles, and will often fight other males until the territory has been decided. Lekking males are certainly bold, and some will even chase people from their territory. This happened to none other than Sir David Attenborough, which you can see on episode 7 of his great documentary series, The Life of Birds. Female capicalies usually breed in their second year, and the males in their third or fourth. The most successful males will mate with up to 25 females, no doubt to the jealousy of the less successful males nearby. Once mated, the females will usually make their nests in cover, by the foot of a tree, usually within a kilometre of the lex site, where they will lay between 5 and 12 eggs. When the chicks hatch, they are usually led to damp, boggy areas, which provide a bounty of protein-rich insects that will help them to grow. Some young birds will stick together well into autumn, by which time their adult feathers have begun to grow, before eventually dispersing. Males usually won't go too far, though females will often disperse 5-10km to 10 km away, with the most ambitious travellers going as far as 30km. Capicale spend much of the winter alone, surrounded by the ice and snow of the harsh Scottish winter. But eventually, when the days start becoming notably longer, the legs will begin again, and the whole cycle will start once more. If they are lucky, Capicales live for six or seven years, meaning that they have up to four or five shots at breeding successfully. Now the Capicale is a bird that has existed for some time, with bones dating back to over 150,000 years ago. But its status in Britain, to say the very least, has been one hell of a roller coaster. For much of the Ice Age, huge ice sheets would have covered much of Britain, rendering most places rather inhospitable to life. But when the last thaw finally came, just under 12,000 years ago, the Capicale would have slowly recolonised the country. They would have been widespread when the first humans arrived, but once agriculture started 6,500 years ago and forest felling began in earnest, their range gradually retreated to Scotland and northern England. 
declined steadily continued over the centuries, with hunting and habitat destruction remaining serious problems, till in 1785 they became extinct in the UK. However, they were successfully reintroduced back to the country 50 years later, in 1837, and more releases came over the next decade. Unexpectedly, thanks to a few new factors, their numbers quickly rocketed. A lot of reforestation for the creation of deer shooting estates was happening at the time, as hunting was becoming an increasingly popular hobby. There was also a lot less demand for timber, as our wars with France were finally over, meaning many forests in Scotland were free to grow again. These two factors meant that there was a lot more suitable habitat for the Capicale than there was a century earlier, and the numbers increased to 20,000 by the turn of the century, though they never really expanded beyond the Scottish border. Another bonus to them was that gamekeepers were now killing a lot of predatory species, meaning fewer young birds were being predated. Although hunting and persecution eventually resumed, on the whole the population prospered, and with numbers up, for a while it looked like this species would once again be a permanent component of the Scottish Highlands. However, the survival of the Capicale in Britain is sadly now in doubt again, even though they've had strict legal protection since 1981. In the last 50 years, the population has declined by 90%, and of the roughly 700 that are left, almost all of which now probably live within Cairngorms National Park. So why are they in so much trouble? Well, there are several factors at work, but probably the most serious issues are habitat fragmentation and deterioration, and their respective effects on breeding success. Focusing first on fragmentation, recent studies say that the minimum area needed to sustain 450 capicades, which is the minimum population that is considered healthy, is 250 square kilometres. This sounds optimistic, as the Cairngorms National Park alone is nearly twice its size. But many of the formerly suitable areas for capicades within the park and elsewhere have deteriorated to the point where suitable areas are now very patchy. First of all, this is an issue for genetic diversity, as populations are less capable of mixing and studies in the coming months will be able to reveal how serious this problem is. Patchy habitat also restricts the birds from dispersing far, which is necessary to avoid competition and to give the birds the opportunity to leave areas that might temporarily be unproductive. And finally, another problem of habitat fragmentation, particularly in areas that have become patchy from nearby forestry and urbanisation, is that predators such as foxes, stoats and crows have better access to their habitat. The population of these predators have exploded in recent years, increasing predation of capicale eggs and chicks. This is probably largely down to reduced persecution, as the number of gamekeepers has dropped by two-thirds since the war. But also, the large animals that once predated on these smaller predators, such as the wolf, bear and lynx, are also absent from the country. And this is a crucial point, because their absence actually also feeds to the second habitat problem, deterioration. Habitat deterioration is a huge problem for the Capicale, so what's happened to the forests of Scotland, which, at first glance, might seem perfectly normal? Well, in simple terms, Scotland's forests aren't really that natural anymore, as most of the key species that would have shaped their natural structure back in the day are now missing. In the past, large herbivores such as the bison, rowan red deer, elk and the aurochs, the extinct ancestor of the cow, would have grazed and browsed the woodland, opening up areas by nibbling away shrubs and young trees, and allowing smaller plants to flourish. But crucially, their populations would have been kept in check by large predators, such as the aforementioned wolf and lynx. This meant that pressure on young trees was never too high, and just as crucially, the predators would have kept them on the move, allowing at least some trees and shrubs to mature and grow. This led to structural diversity and plenty of ground cover, which was perfect for the capicale. Today in Britain, all our large predators are gone, and of the native large herbivores, only the rowan red deer remain in Scotland. Without any predators to suppress their numbers, and with milder winters leading to more weak and old individuals surviving, deer numbers in Scotland have rocketed in recent decades, with the red deer population estimated to now be the highest in Europe, with 400,000 individuals. Because of this, there is now huge pressure on young trees and shrubs, many of which are nibbled to death before they have a chance to grow. This presents many problems to the capicales. There's now a lot less shrub cover to protect them from predators, new woodlands that could potentially link suitable habitats aren't allowed to grow, and the sheer abundance of deer has taken its toll on their important food plants, such as the bilberry. Restricting deer from certain areas might seem like the answer, but this can actually be even worse. Collision with deer fences, as the birds fly through the forest, are a major cause of capicale deaths. Although many have been removed, as much as a third of capicales may still die this way, especially males and young birds. 
Restricting herbivores from areas is also bad from an ecological point of view too, for many reasons. Without sunlight grazing pressure, heather will eventually dominate the forest floor in many areas, smothering other food plants, and if it becomes too wet and the chicks can't get away from it, they may die of hypothermia. Lack of herbivores also mean that patches of soil won't be churned up, which should otherwise be done by their hooves, and allow new opportunities for plants and berries. And in the long term, the forest will become dense, emitting sunlight and arresting growth on the forest floor. Forestry practices aren't helping much, as most new forests are dense monocultures, and they often consist of non-native spruces, which are not ideal for our native wildlife. Practices such as clear felling, when the trees are taken down en masse, are also detrimental. Another issue is climate change. Chicks are very sensitive, and will struggle not only in wet springs, but also in droughts, which will dry up important boggy areas. And the final large problem is rising disturbance. The Kengoms now receive over a million visits a year, and repeated disturbance can repel the birds from visiting otherwise suitable habitat, as well as causing them stress, which in turn can affect their breeding success. So those are the main threats to the Cabocale. So the question now is, what can we do to save them from extinction in Scotland? Firstly, on a broader level, it's imperative for conservation groups to first get the support of local communities and landowners. Locals have their own interests in the area, so it's important to listen to them to find win-win scenarios. With their support, they can also help organise events, rally up volunteers, as well as raise awareness and pass on important conservation messages to the wider community through word of mouth. Fortunately, this is happening, which I'll discuss later. Practically speaking, there's much that needs to be done to keep the cappers alive, so let's highlight the threats again and see what can be done to solve them, whilst also gaining economic and social opportunities that we can all benefit from too. First of all, and sadly there's no avoiding it, deer numbers must be lowered. Once this is done, the biodiverse structurally mixed forest that Capicales need will recover, new habitats will form and become connected, and the deadly deer fences can be removed. Culling deer, however, can be controversial, both to deer estate owners and to sections of the public. But there are actually many financial and social benefits to be gained from reducing deer numbers. Let's first focus on estate owners. Currently, deer shooting estates are raking in only a fraction of the money that they could potentially be making, and if deer numbers were lowered, they would open up the possibility of generating a lot more revenue. Today, deer estates account for 20% of the surface area of Scotland. The turnover that stays in the country is estimated to be around £70 million, and the industry employs about 2,500 people. Translating these figures, that means that deer shooting contributes a mere 0.04% to Scotland's economy, employs just 0.008% of the British employment market, yet it takes up one-fifth of Scotland's land, which is a huge waste when you think about it. Areas and estates have reduced deer numbers are turning into tourist hotspots, because these more natural landscapes are more attractive and from visitors come many economic and social benefits to the wider area. For example, Glen Affric, which has expanded its area of woodlands over the last 30 years by reducing deer numbers, now draws around 130,000 visitors a year. Estates would benefit hugely from having fewer deer and enticing tourism. And with enough linked habitats, the door could potentially open to reintroducing lost animals back, such as the elk, lynx and wolf, which would make the areas even bigger tourist magnets. New jobs could come in the form of safari guides, eateries and accommodation, and revenue can still be brought in from deer hunting. More holiday makers might choose to visit such areas over going abroad, especially in light of the cost of living crisis. This will keep more money in the UK and reduce the number of carbon releasing flights. Such changes could also improve mental health, which is deeply connected to our access to natural places. The Scottish Government could support this, subsidising deer culls or offering tax cuts to those who do so. Much of the public are also against culling, but as it can help both the climate and ecological emergencies, which in turn affect the money in our pockets and our well-being, with the right education I'm sure everyone will see the benefits of deer control. For example, the trees that will be allowed to grow will take CO2 from the air and will better capture rain, reducing floods and soil runoff, saving millions of taxpayers' money. Cold deer could also become a thriving industry of ethically sourced meat, perhaps funded by the government. This could employ thousands of people and reduce our need for meat imports, bringing us closer to net zero. 
If the deer are taken care of, the capercaillies population would be able to take off much quicker, and further restoration of the forest will be much easier. Some areas might need thinning to let sunlight in and allow the forest floor to flourish, whilst others might need planting of shrubs to offer shelter. Non-native trees should be removed and boggy areas restored. Small-scale heather cutting should also be practiced in the short term, but ultimately, animals should be brought in to save us the hassle. Herds of cattle could be released, which will graze and disturb the heather much like their wild ancestors did before them. This has already started to get underway, with a herd released to a section of the park earlier this year. Deer fences should, if possible, be removed, and until then, attaching noticeable wooden droppers to the fences should at least reduce collisions. And when harvesting timber, we should ideally aim for it to be done selectively and on a rotational basis, and clear felling should be avoided when possible. When it comes to predators that take capercaillie chicks at worrying levels, unfortunately many of them must be culled too, with the exception of the pine martin, that should be trapped alive and relocated elsewhere, even though some debate the feasibility of this. Ideally, this should be a joint action with landowners, who should be given advice and access to funding for predator control. Culling predators should be seen as a temporary solution until we improve and link habitats. And perhaps in the future, with restored ecosystems and communities consulted, we can reintroduce large predators back to Britain, which will restore natural order and control the number of these animals for us. This is certainly a controversial issue, and some of you might not like this idea, but it's important to remember that these animals are here in much higher densities than they should be, and that they have an effect on other species. If you're still not convinced, I'd recommend you read these two books by Mary Colwell if you want a more comprehensive answer to why it's right that we do this. But boiling it down, we shouldn't let our sentimentality towards abundant predators allow an extinction of any species, which are themselves sentimental to many people. And finally, when solving disturbance, planting conifers in dense rows along sections of footpath to reduce visibility could be an option. Various signs and messages can also raise awareness, both at key sites and on local social media groups. And in the most extreme scenarios, sections of path could be closed on a trial basis during the breeding season. So those are the main solutions to save the Capicale, and we're lucky that there are several organisations fighting to save them right now. Groups like Nature Scott, the RSPB, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, the Cairngorms National Park Authority, and others, with the collaboration of private owners and the Scottish Government, are working hard to ensure the future of these birds. And in 2018, a significant boost came with the formation of the Cairngorms Capicale project. By working closely with local communities, the project has already made some great strides, and I've provided a few examples if you'd like to read. This is a great start, and hopefully they and their project partners will go from strength to strength in the years ahead. Wrapping up, the Capicale is a fantastic species, a real gem of our ancient woodlands, where our culture and national identity first formed. We should feel privileged that this bird is still found on British soil, and although their future is far from certain, let's remain optimistic. As I have hopefully shown, the ways forward to save this bird relate to a much wider picture of enhancing ourselves. Through saving the Capicale, not only will the next generation be able to enjoy this amazing bird, but we could also enhance the UK's economy, return jobs to rural Scotland, give locals a say, improve mental health, and help solve the climate and ecological emergencies. Whilst in the short term there's a lot of management we need to do ourselves, in the long term we should look to nature to do the work for us, which will allow us more time to sit back and enjoy the thriving ecosystems that this country can offer. So, as long as we know that there's still capicales around, perhaps we should have hope that there could be a thriving future for us too. So let's spread the word and hold on to this fantastic species. Thanks for watching folks, this is quite a unique video on my channel, so if you'd like to see more videos of the sort in the future, then please like and subscribe, and until next time, so long for now.